take a, a scripture reading and just come up with a song for it. Um, my friend Bruce is videoing this uh, sermon, so. so please pray with me. Lord, I thank you that we are all gathered here today to worship you, and I ask that your Holy Spirit be among us, as I know that you are spirit among us, and help us to just put away the stuff that we brought into and be open to God's word, turn our eyes upon Jesus as we have sung. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Well, it's uh, great to be back here. I don't think I've been to this particular uh, incarnation of new creation, <laughs> but I've been to new creation when it was on Broad Street, meeting at St. Paul's Episcopal Church. Of course, it wasn't just St. Paul's Episcopal, it was new creation MCC. So it's really great to be back. I see some faces that I know and some that I don't, and some that I just met this morning. So really, thank you for being here. Um, I have to warn you, uh-oh, here comes the guest <laughs> preacher, <laughs> warning you. Uh, you, those of you who have chosen to be here when you could have been out on some tree-lined path watching the beautiful leaves come down or maybe sitting at Cup of Joe or your other favorite coffee shop and watching all the beautiful people go by on Sunday morning and maybe engaging them in conversation, if you're lucky, but I thank you that you're here. And I do have a message for you this morning that I believe God gave me. But the, the warning is this. Okay, bar, first, there, bar the doors, nobody leaves. <laughs> See, I told you, Charlie, they laugh at anything. You're giving this serious message and they, they just wanna laugh. But thank you, thank you for laughing. It kind of breaks up the, the, the seriousness of the moment because I do believe that God definitely laughs with us. Not at us, but with us. But the warning is, I've been reading a historical novel, and actually I'm finished with the novel, and I'm, I'm reading parts of it over again, but it's called Saints and Villains, if any of you have ever heard of it. It's called Saints and Villains, and it, the copyright is 1998, so it's a fairly recent book, a fairly recent book, you know, if you're as old as I am. And it's a historical <laughs> fiction, another laugh, good, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a historical fiction about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, now, how many of you have heard of him? Okay, we got a few people who have heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But I'll tell you who he is. He's a German pastor, or he was, a German pastor and a theologian who was one of the few Christians to speak out against the Nazi regime and against Hitler in the 1930s and 1940s. He's one of the few anybody's in Germany to speak out against the, the Fuhrer. And then I'll grant it, if you're one of the few Christians to speak out too, of course, you would think the Christian church would kind of get that what Hitler was doing was not a Christian thing, but it took people a while to catch on. Now granted, they didn't know at first when Hitler came to power, but it became slowly over the years obvious to all the atrocities he and his administration were committing. And Pastor Bonhoeffer just would not shut up he was living in Germany, he had a chance to come to the United States, he had a chance to get out of Germany, but he went back because he wanted to be where his people were fighting this battle, right on the very battlefield in Germany. A very dangerous place to be if you were speaking out against Hitler, with all those SS officers running around ready to, ready to kill you, ready to shoot you, ready to hang you. He was instrumental in forming what they called the Confessing Church. This was against the German Christian Church, the National Church, where most Christians belonged in Germany. And yes, I said that right. Most of the Christians in Germany supported Hitler and the Nazis. It was just patriotic after all, after they started a war. That was the patriotic thing to do. Now true, they didn't know, like I said, exactly what Hitler was up to at first. And after all, those uppity Jews who were called dirty and everything else, and those of us who are part of minority groups, and I think that probably includes everybody, <laughs> consider GLBT folks, know 
what it's like to be called dirty and no good and sinner and all of that. Well, the Jews were called this, and they were also called uppity and rich, as if they were, oh, so the, one of the charges were, was that they were taking their money out of Germany and sending it to bank accounts in Sweden or Switzerland, either one. So they were being, and maybe they deserved, according to some of the people in Germany, maybe they deserved to be harassed and insulted and then deported. At first they were just being deported. Nobody knew they were going to concentration camps. That didn't happen until later. At first they were just being deported. Never mind that other countries, including this one, didn't want very many Jews, actually turned boats away and sent them back to Germany. Other countries weren't taking too many Jews either. Didn't want too many of those folks. So where were they to go then? That's why gradually Hitler came up with that final solution. Bonhoeffer, who studied theolo theology, this was before Hitler came to power, at Union Theological School in New York City, those of you who have ever heard of that school, it's sort of on the liberal side. Thank goodness. Because Bonhoeffer, as he went to this school and associated with many other what we, today we might call liberal budding theologians and liberal pastors, from them he learned that, he came to realize that the theoret theoretical and intricate theology he knew and loved, sort of the traditional Christian theology, had no value if it didn't help people where they live. It didn't help people to in their struggle to even survive, even survive physically. And I know some of us now are struggling economically, so we know what it's like just to try to survive. And we need a, a Christian theology that helps us in that struggle, not that tells us uh, you just have to believe. Yeah, I think that's important just to believe. I do believe that's important. But we need, as they say, faith with legs, faith with feet faith that does something to help people who are oppressed. And that includes ourselves, many of us. Now, what has all this got to do with the psalm? You bet you thought I was just going to preach on a book. No, I am. But it's also this book right here. That I, have, I believe this book has all kinds of value and all kinds of messages for us to hear. And what has this to do with this, this psalm that Byron made the song about, Psalm 34? Or poor old blind Bartimaeus crying out to Jesus, begging by the side of the road. He was certainly economically oppressed but, and blind, too. That was probably one of the few professions you could have if you were blind in those days. Beggar. Hmm. Well, I think it, the readings today have several things to say and several connections to the book that I mentioned. And going back to the psalm a little bit, Psalm 34. Verse 6, I mean, you get this message out of this that's pretty much the same, and it's a good message. Verse 6 says, The poor man called, and the Lord heard him. God saved him out of all his troubles. And then in verse 22, The Lord redeems God's servants. And then in verse 19, A righteous man may have many troubles. Note that one. Who knew that once we became, <laughs> try to be, I'm not saying we're all righteous, but we try to be, that we would still have so many troubles. But a righteous man or a righteous person has many troubles, but the Lord delivers that person from all of them. Well, that's nice to know. How long, oh Lord? <laughs> and Bartimaeus got his sight back, right? That was a good thing. End of story. Can I sit down now? We just have to cry loud enough to Jesus and we get healed and go on our merry way and everything's good again. There was, a, to add more to this idea, there, the, one of the other readings for the lectionary, which all many Christian churches use this Sunday, is the book of Job. I didn't read that passage because actually I want to do it more with Job than just a couple of, than just a few verses. But the Hollywood ending of Job, that was the lectionary today, and I call it the Hollywood ending because a lot of, many scholars think the ending was added on, that Job really didn't need the ending at the end, but nonetheless, it's there, it's there in our, our Bible as we have it today. In the Hollywood ending, which you probably know, Job gets everything back that he lost. He gets his land, 
his, his houses. Uh, he didn't lose his wife at least, but I'm not sure that was such a good thing. <laughs>